Welcome to ASAL Community Church, where serving and giving begins. We look to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ, who demonstrated the greatest example of service and sacrifice. We believe by following his example, we can unlock the abundance of this life and be assured about our glorious and boundless future. As we gather here today, we acknowledge the power of triune God. We offer sincere praises to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We worship and adore the maker of the heavens and earth. Indeed, we collectively affirm. We desire godly change in our lives. We're expecting God to meet us here in a mighty way. We are determined to leave this place wiser, stronger, more joyful, and equipped with biblical truth to help us conquer the week ahead. We expect God's best leaning on him for daily direction and resolving to renew our minds and surrender our hearts to his word. We long to understand the true posture of worship, the power of earnest praise, the blessing of hearing the word and applying it to our lives. As we look around, we realize that serving the Lord is not confined to these walls. God gathers us here for instructions, but sends us out to share the message of reconciliation. Acceptance of the shed blood of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection are essential to abundance in this life and the next. We are here to win souls for Christ, encourage those who do not know him personally, and build up believers to accept Christ's call and live a purpose-filled life. Everyone is welcome here at ASAL Community Church, where serving and giving begins. center of my joy, oh Jesus, you are the center of my joy, Jesus, you are my You are the center. You are the center. You are, you 
are the center of my, of my joy. the center of my joy, my joy, my joy, my joy, my joy, my joy, yeah, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The center of my joy. Can you do something for me this evening? Can you clap your hands? what he said he would do he's gonna fulfill every promise he made to you don't give up on God he won't give up on you he's able anybody know he's able He's able, oh yeah. Do you know that he's able? Hey, God is able to do just what he said that he would do, yeah. He's gonna fulfill every promise he made to you. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God, yeah. Don't give up on God, cause he won't give up on you. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. he's able. Don't, don't give up. I 
know, I know, I know it looks hard sometimes, yeah. But don't, don't give up. God will never, God will never give up on you. Don't, don't give up. God won't, God won't, God won't. Yeah. Don't, don't give up on God. Cause he won't give up on you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's able, yeah. Oh. Whatever you need, yeah. Whatever you want, whatever you need, whatever you want, hey, whatever you need, whatever you want, whatever you need, whatever you want, whatever you need, hey, whatever you need, whatever you need, whatever you want, whatever you need, whatever you want, whatever you need, whatever you want, whatever you want, whatever you want. Whatever you want, whatever you need, hey, whatever you need, oh, whatever you need, whatever you need, hey, God is able, 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 God is able. Don't give up on God, cause he won't. Give up on you. Don't give up on God. He won't, he won't give up on you. Don't give up on God. Cause he won't give up on you. Don't give up on God. He won't give Cause he's able yeah. Somebody ought to put your hands together And give God some glory God is able Oh yes he
everyone I see.
everything I love you Jesus I worship and adore you just want to tell you More than anything, 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 yeah, more than anything, more than anything, more than anything. More than anything, more than anything, more than anything, yeah. More than anything, more than anything, more than anything, yeah. More than anything, more than anything, more. More than anything, yeah. More than anything, yeah. More than anything, oh, more than anything, yeah. More than anything, more than anything, more than anything. Oh, more than anything, more than anything, more than anything. I love you, Jesus. I worship and I adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more, more than anything. Our Father and our God, creator and sustainer of the universe, make of every good and perfect gift, we come this evening saying thank you, not because we have been so good, but because of your grace and truly your mercy. We are thankful to still be in the land of the living here this evening to worship you in spirit and truth. We're just so thankful, Father, for what you're doing in the midst of this particular church at this particular season that we are called to do the assignment and we are moving forward and diligently in the assignment that you have assigned our hands. So we're thankful for the music that has been played this evening and we'll prepare our minds and our hearts for the word that we'll be better tomorrow than we are today predicated on your word. Bless this service as we move forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to have uh, whew, all of the Peterson children in the house. It is good to have my brother-in-laws and my sister-in-laws and then the family, cousins, the kids, nieces, nephews, and even that young fella sitting right there. You know I get excited when men show up in church, so I'm thankful. And I'm also thankful for the members. Thankful for the members. We'll be praying for Karen. She called me today that she's dealing with walking pneumonia and Linda's getting over the flu. And we're still praying for Terrell as she has uh, been grieving over the passing of her sister-in-law. So with that being said and done, thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Teddy Wright. And even that young guy over there, you know, whatever your name is. <laughs> it's good to have you here, Mr. Gerard Black. I'm so thankful. And uh, it's good to have David on the back and, and my bonus daughter back there and my granddaughter. I saw your leg moving. You good? You good? All right. Yeah. And you too. Yeah, I see you, RJ. And all. It's, good. it's good to have y'all here, the people of God, for the word of God says that when we come together as family, nothing is more unified than those who know the Lord and who are called. So I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm always thankful for the opportunity to preach God's word. But what I really like about preaching is that it's a it's a simple message. The word of God is simple. Now we have tended to make it more complicated than it really is. And I just look for the simplicity. I look for simplicity. I look for simplicity in life. And the reason why I look for the simplicity, because at the end of the day, none of this is going with us. 
None of this is going with us. And so it's no need to spend your life uh, complicated or dealing with a lot of confusion. Just try to find a way to simplify. I guarantee you that your life will be better, your stress will be down, and you'll have more joy in your life. If, if you agree with that, you know. The things that we have, there are things that we have, and things are meant to be enjoyed. I don't think it's bad, whatever you have. I, I really don't. I think that you should have some things that allow you to enjoy your life while you're on this side. Sometimes people look at you and they think because of whatever you have that you might be a certain type of person, and that's really their problem, not mine. I use things for enjoyment. Another thing that I do in life that I encourage you to do is to invest, because we have to invest. You should invest. And what is investing? Investing is nothing more than putting something somewhere expecting later a return. That's investing. Putting something somewhere, investing in something, hoping that later that you'll have a return on your investment. And in today's society, that is not always guaranteed. You can look at the stock market and tell that's not guaranteed. I, I have some Bitcoin, and a few weeks ago, I should have cashed out when it was $45,000 a share. Now it's down to forty one. I have lost some, not all, but I have lost some. So there's an uncertainty even in investing. But tonight, I'm going to show you where an investment never loses its value. In the Bible, we are called to be good stewards. Why would you be called to be a good steward? Because God has entrusted something in your care, whether it be relationships or children. Somewhere along the line, God has entrusted something in your care, and whatever it is, you ought to be a good steward over it. And why should you be a good steward, steward over something? Well, the reason why you should truly be a good steward is because you didn't earn it. He gave it to you. He gave it to you. And so our works, what we do for kingdom building is an investment towards a heavenly reward. But at the end of the day, it's our, our mindset. A mindset you should have is to do good. I tell people that all the time. Think about it. If you were just being good, what, what do you have to lose? What, what do you have to lose just being good, being honest, and just being good? That's a good life. I, I tell people all the time, when I hear a siren, I'm never afraid because I, I live a good life. I'm not, I'm not worried about police stopping me because I live a good life. Sometimes people get nervous based upon certain situations they find themselves in. Well, I feel like if I'm going to the football game, I should be in a safe environment, unless I'm wearing a Dallas Cowboys jersey. I know it's right, that's why I wrote it in my notes. <laughs> but live a good life and just allow your works to speak for yourself. So that should be your mindset. It's just be good. Because once we depart from here, nothing that we have worked so diligently have will, will go with us. We, it just does it. Everything that you have worked for over and over again, and no matter how much time you have put in to build up, you will leave it to someone or, or, or somebody who will not appreciate all that you did to acquire that. So just enjoy life. So, so you ask me, and I'll tell you, how do you enjoy life? Just, just be obedient to the word, follow the instructions, and live in the rewards of both. That's the simple answer. Be obedient. Be mindful of the instructions. And if you do that, there is a reward. So where is that found in the scriptures? Where, where is all that? When anything that you say, it should be able to be backed up. Anything that I share with the congregation, I want to make sure you know exactly where it's found, how it applies to whatever it is I'm saying, because I'm not trying to make nothing up, and then make it simple for you to digest and apply it in your life if you choose. Because no one should force this on anyone. This should be something that you willingly uh, uh, receive if you 
believe. So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Last week I preached on verse 17 and 18, and tonight I'm going to preach from verse 19. But for your hearing, let's just read it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. And verse 17 says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be hardy, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Verse 18 says, let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Verse 19 says, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold unto eternal life. My sermon title is Ready, Willing, and Should. Ready, Willing, and Should. And last week we talked about the rich and why would you have to instruct rich people how to act? Because if you've been around rich people, they can be a little bit arrogant. They can seem to be a, a know-it-all. There's some things about rich people that, that regular folks just don't, don't deal with. There's a pride that comes with being rich, maybe aloof. And so the writer says, let me remind the rich folks that, that whatever they have their trust in, if you, if you think that your trust is in your riches, it's uncertain. And whatever you have, God has richly given you all things to enjoy. It ain't you. It ain't you. It's him blessing you and allowing you to have. Verse 18 says, let them do good. That's a simple approach to life. Just do good. And there's a reason why. It says because that, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Because when you do good, you want to see the good in others. I, I see people that are homeless and, and I feel sorry for them. And, and, I, and I want to sometimes try to figure out if there's a road that I could help them get on to get off the road they are currently on. And after five years in ministry and, and trying to do the best that I can to do good and to be good, I've come to some conclusions that some people just don't want to change their situation. And there's nothing you can do to force a person, but all I can do is offer. But I want it to be recorded as my good works because I'm ready to give, I'm willing to share, and I should, but it doesn't necessarily always happen that way. So tonight we want to look at verse 19. And verse 19 says, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold unto eternal life. So the writer says, storing up for themselves. I don't know how many sermons you have heard in your life. I really don't. But if you ever hear a sermon from me here at Asaw Community Church, I will always tell you the same thing. The same thing that I'm going to share tonight, I have shared countless times. That whenever you read the Bible, it is a personal journey between you and God. Everything that you will read just lines up in your life if you choose to have a relationship with him. All the Bible is is the instructions on to how to allow you to grow to a level of trust in your faith. That's it. This is, this is the simple approach to the Bible. So even here in verse 19, it says, storing up for themselves, meaning you. Things that you have to do, I have to do, we have to do for what? For our, for our final reward. For the reward that does not perish. The things that we have in this world will perish. They will get old. They will deteriorate. But so as believers, we have to act and we should move in accordance to God's will. But that's if we are believers. 
The word is very simple. It just tells you to be generous. It tells you to be good. It does not set a standard in which you have to operate in front of God. He just wants to know where is your heart and wherever your heart is, your, your good works will come out of that. If your heart is hard, there's nothing coming out of that. But if your heart is generous, if you understand that God is only looking at the things that you do that build the kingdom, all is well. Don't get caught up in all of these denominations. Denominations come from people being mad at other people. How, how do you know that? Because there's over 27,000 denominations, yet one word. Lutheran, Mormon, Protestant, Catholic. It's because somebody saw something and interpreted it differently and said, we're going to take the people that believe this and come over here and says, I'm the one who first read that and established it. We'll now be Lutheran. But the simplicity of the word is God is looking for believers who are willing to do a work for the Lord, to be generous, who are investing in things that mean more to God than cause. When we invest in God's work, we are investing in heavenly treasures. Do you know what a blessing is? A blessing is when someone has done something for you that they did not have to do, but because of their generosity, they did it. That's why the Bible is clear. It's a blessing to be a blessing. It's better to give than to receive. Why would it be better to give? Because when you're in the position to give, that means you have an abundance. That means you don't lack and you've allowed somebody else to get close to where you are. It's better to give than to receive. So in verse 19, it's just saying, your good works are stored up in heaven. You know what's not stored up in heaven? Huh? Money, your car, your position, your homes. Do you know that in heaven you can be poor but yet rich there, but you might be poor here, and some people may be rich here and poor there. Why? Because some people don't have a heart to give. Some people are very selfish. And that's why in verse 17, he said, command those who are rich in this present age, meaning those who are rich down here, not to be haughty, not to be conceited, not to be uh, overly, overly uh, prideful, thinking that what they've done has ascertained what they have, when in fact it all comes from him. But then again, if you don't thank him for anything that you have, you'll think it's you. So it says, storing up for themselves a good foundation for, for the time to come. Your generosity should be in accordance to your abundance. This is, this is not, a, this is not a, a, a competition. See, some people think that because they wrote the big check with the big numbers and commas and zeros that they are better. Remember in the story, Jesus said to the woman, to the people, the woman who gave two bits gave more than all of y'all because you gave out of your abundance. You gave so you could hear people applaud you for giving, but she gave all that she had. So your generosity should be in accordance to the abundance. We're not competing with each other. Why? How, how can, the reason why we're not competing is because everything we have, he allowed us to have. I, I did not make way for you to have. You worked and God had a plan for each and every one of you. But it's up to you to talk to him or to connect with him or to have a relationship with him to figure out what is the plan and what is the will for your life. But that's between you and God. That's why we can't judge. How can I, how can I judge if I can't attribute none of your success? I, I'm not the one who woke you up this morning. He did. I might have been the one that been your alarm clock and told you to get up. But if it was because of his permissive will that he allowed you to rise, it ain't got nothing to do with me. Because if God said today he bringing you home, there's nothing I can do. And I don't care how much money you got in the bank, it ain't going to change your end. I remember when I was watching the movie Steve Jobs and he was dying, and one of the things he said is, I wish I had of listen 
to the people who told me how, how severely sick I was. And even if he had to listen, that didn't mean it was going to prolong. It's the life that you have. What's important? What, what should we be doing with the life that we, we have? We should be storing up a good foundation for the time to come. It says laying up in store. Well, what, what does that mean? It, it, it's you. It's you. It's what you should be doing. What I should be doing. What each and every person should be doing is, is storing up what? Good deeds, good works, generosity, being just good. Because it pleases God and it's a blessing to those who see it, who benefit from it, and who are a part of it. Your good works you'll enjoy in eternity. The good works are, are you. And it says a good foundation. Why is a good foundation important? Here's why a good foundation is important. I don't care how many storms you have seen, hurricanes, tornadoes, or even earthquakes. Houses have been destroyed. Some things have been burned to the ground. But when it was all said and done, what was still left? Foundation. Foundations that are securely built persevere. Why is the family crumbling today? It's because of the foundation. And see, when you have a family that has crumbled, it's because truth has got in there and people have fled because nobody likes truth. That's why they say, you know, they think the grass is green on the other side. Grass is green where you work it, where you till it, where you fertilize it, where you water it, where you cut it. Wherever you are in life is good if the foundation in which you operate is operating truthfully. But, but, again, we live in a society where we don't want to hurt no one's feelings. That's, that, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to tell you the truth that whatever you do in life, there has to be a foundation. And the foundation, when it's secure, is built on trust. Built on trust. My brother-in-law's wife is a psychologist, and she didn't even know she was going to be in the sermon tonight. She works in the prison system. And it's dangerous in the prison system. But she said something last night, and I wrote it down. She said that she's not afraid because there are inmates in the prison that will protect her. How does she know? Trust. How does she know that trust is because of the relationship? And because she knows that her back is covered, she's comfortable. Same relationship with God. You got to know that not only will he cover you, he'll protect you, but you got to have a relationship. And if you have a relationship with him, there's the faith kicking in. But here's the foundation, and the foundation allows you to trust. But you can't trust nothing you don't understand. You can't trust nothing you don't know. And I'm telling you that this trust will never dissipate. Why? Because he created the whole order in which we live. So a foundation for anything to last should be placed on a solid understanding. This church, your home, your relationship. So when the storms come, which they will, Storms will come. You will not be destroyed. Foundations stay intact when they are built correctly. Even in a home, even in a home, the home can be destroyed. Because I'm telling you something, I didn't know anything was as powerful as water. Water is powerful. And water will look for the least resistance to move. And, and I remember when I lived in California, I was going to buy a boat. I was living down by this, uh, well, I was living in the desert, but I used to go to church down by this marina. And I said, man, that'd be great. Finish church, get on my boat, ride over to Catalina. And I had gone and I found the boat. And I was making a deal and I'd already found a marina. And, and I, I put the numbers together and I said, that's affordable. And then I started working on cruise ships. And my first ship, we went through a hurricane. And I looked at those seven to 25 foot swells and how it moved this big vessel just like a, a, a cap, you know, like a bottle cap. And that was it for me and my dreams of a boat. Because if this ship was moving, and I just realized how powerful water was and how helpless I was. 
but in life I know that no matter what storm I go through God will bring me through why because whenever you're going through a storm and Roger you can attest to this whenever a storm arises never stop keep moving in the direction of the storm eventually the storm will be behind you but people most of the time complain about the storm, sit in the storm, and then the storm hovers over them. I'm telling you that based upon my relationship with God, knowing that he tests my faith, knowing that he's there to protect me regardless of what's going on, I keep moving in the face of adversity. Why? Because I trust him to bring me through. It's part of my foundation. So we all, pastors, preachers, teachers, deacons, elders, whatever title you prescribe to, we all have the opportunity to do what? To lay up treasures for ourselves, to do good that represents him. So your foundation is solid, it's permanent, and it's everlasting. Allow your resources that God has allowed you to have, to bless you to have, to be a blessing to the kingdom. That's it. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a whole lot to this relationship with God. Believe, trust, move forward. That's it. That's it. I, I, know, I know people think that it's more to it and, and you got to be super saved and super spiritual and, and you got to do so many. Listen, listen, listen. Read what God, Jesus did. Jesus did everything simple. Whenever somebody asked him a question, he didn't give him a convoluted answer. He gave him what? A parable. A story. Something simple, a sentence or two, changing your tomorrow today. But you just got to believe that. I don't have to believe it for you. You have to believe it for yourself. Why? Because it's a personal journey. And my journey is mine. And guess who got to answer for my journey? Me. Who has to answer for the deeds I've done? Me. You got to answer for you. I got to answer for me. I don't care how many times your mother and father have prayed for you. That's good that they have. But you have to know and realize for yourself. And it's up to you. Nobody's ever going to force you. And if they did, then it's not of God. Somebody forces you, that's not of God, that's of them. Because sometimes people think when they get to a certain plateau that they think they're in, in religion or God or Christianity or whatever title they use, they think that they are superior being. But you got to realize that everybody starts from the same place. So I can't be no better than you. All I have is an assignment because I was called to do a job. Other than that, guess what? I'm on the same road as you. That's why sometimes people see pastors or preachers get in some trouble and people say, I can't believe that. Why? The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short. But the problem is we spend our time judging. I'm not your judge. I'm just here to give you a road that I believe based upon the word of God will be beneficial for you and in your life. So how do you know? Because in the word it says storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. Meaning there is a time and it's coming. And I can't tell you when. So all I'm going to try to do is tell you to be prepared. That's why you invest. I mean, I've invested. I remember when I was 27, the guy told me, he said, you should open up a Roth. And I said, what is it? He said, what's in a, a retirement account, IRA Roth? He said, you should do it. And I said, well, how? He told me, he said, just send what you have. And so I went to all my comedian friends, and I said, hey, man, I met this guy. He said, we should open up this retirement account. We were all 27, 28, 29. And you know what they did? Laughed. All of them laughed. All of them laughed. And I started sending in my little $12 and $18 and $52 and $19. Y'all remember my guy, he came and told you. I, I never sent in 50 or 100, I didn't. I was sending change, I was sending my change and whatever the odd number in my account was. If I had $53.19, I sent the $3.19. And now, 58, soon to be 59, Lord willing, I'm, I'm shifting to retirement mode. And, and guess what happened to those guys that I told y'all about? They all now, they, they, they just taking all types of gigs because they got to. And when I tell them I don't have to, I'm not trying to brag or be braggadocious, but I invested for a time like this. 
And that's how life is. You have to invest for a time because that time is coming. That's why I tell the young fella right there, hey, man, you can work hard as you want. But guess what? Ain't none of that hard work going with you. So you might as well take time off, enjoy your family, grow your family, be, a, be, be present in their life. Because so many relationships have been destroyed because you spent so much time thinking, I got to press into this job and it ain't going. And when you drop dead, they're going to replace you on Tuesday. I remember Miss Young, she told me when I was a kid, she said, when I retire, I'm going to do all these grand things. And I said, when are you going to retire, Miss Young? And she told me the date. And I remember her daughter called me and said, will you be in Baltimore at this time? I said, why? She said, my mother's having a retirement party. I said, retirement party? She's not retiring until this particular time. She said, no, my mother has cancer, and she's retiring now. And Miss Young never got to do any of the things that she had on her list because she was waiting to retire to do it. And I remember when she died, when her daughter went down to get her mother's stuff, they had already cleared the desk, put it in a box, and already had somebody else sitting at the table. Better enjoy your life. Better enjoy the things that God has bestowed upon you that you can enjoy because in Ecclesiastes, they tell us none of this stuff is going with us. The only thing that we can be assured of is that we will check up out of here one day. And there is a place if you believe for your soul because the body returns back to the dust. So it says again in verse 19, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold unto eternal life. That, that's, that, that's what this journey is all about. That you, you, you know, people try to figure out, well, why am I here? If you can't answer the question of why you are here, here's a good place to start. There's a purpose that God has for you based upon your experiences, based upon the things that you have gone through, based upon the type of person you are. He can utilize that skill set in a certain area. I can't help you if you are a drug addict. I do not know what that is. I have never had an addiction in my life, but I can tell you about about family because I've had some failures and my failures have made me strong enough to stand boldly and proclaim and profess that you know why I had some failures because my foundation was jacked up because I wasn't listening to the word of God I was listening to me and me had an idea of how this thing was supposed to go and based upon me doing me guess what happens when you do you people can debate that they can go I don't really believe that but you can't debate this this is in fact the word of God so therefore I should have moved my responsibilities from me onto the pages of the book so when I see situations in life I just try to give people a word I'm not trying to force that on you and if you don't believe that's between you and God but at the end of the day did somebody tell you along the way hey look at this and apply this to that and see if that outcome doesn't change for you why because we should be about doing what good being generous and storing things that will be not only beneficial to you but beneficial to others laying up in store so I'm always going to teach and preach a relationship that is personal between you and God and what you should see should just be the example of him so again the sermon title is called ready willing and should we are ready we should be willing and we should and sometimes our should get stopped and why does it get stopped it gets stopped because we we look at what other people are doing or how other people may perceive us I am telling you that is a personal journey it does not have to do anything with your status financially has not has anything to do with what denomination you are a part of it has everything to do with do you trust the foundation in which you are standing based upon your faith and belief in God and if you do that if you do that if you believe that then the life that comes after this life that so many people struggle in is a reward how do you know that people struggle in life because people do things 
And my, my brother-in-law's wife understands that she deals with people who have done things because they have struggled in life. And they felt that whatever they were going to do may have been the answer. Finding themselves incarcerated is not the answer. There could have been a better road, but because the foundation may be fractured or shattered, or maybe not even there in so many people's lives. Sometimes people don't even get a solid foundation until they have fallen into the abyss. And I guess once you fall that low, I guess you can can stand on something to build yourself way back up. But I'm here to tell you that you should just be faithful in life. You should be generous. You should trust God and be willing to serve. Confessing and believing, that's all you really have to do. You just have to believe that he had a son who died and rose for you. That's it. The thief on the cross said, hey, remember me when you get to paradise. Jesus said, on this day you'll be with me. So I'm here to tell you that all you have to do is believe. All you have to do is move in the direction of your belief and God will take care of the rest. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. I'm just telling you what we should do. I didn't tell you that you had to do it. I tell people all the time, I, I, don't, I don't, even my wife, I ask her, I don't tell her. Matter of fact, I think that's what I should do, start telling her. She told me a couple weeks ago, she said, when you tell me, it takes me longer to do it. So I said, you know what, I'm going to just start telling her. See how you fix that? I ain't going to have no argument. I'm too old. I'm too old to argue. I'm too old. I just let things go now. And the reason why is because I've been there. You know how it is when you were young, you thought you had all the answers. Come on, all of us been there. I'm like, man, bump this. Let me just do good. Let me just be generous. Let me get out of the way. And it works. It works. It works. The doors of the church are open here at Esau Community Church. Membership is important. People say, well, I don't have to be a member of the church. No, you should be a member of the church. You should be a member of the church. There's some benefits that come with membership. Some benefits, some, some extra benefits that come. One of the things that comes with membership is, is uh, fellowship. Yeah, people are looking forward to seeing you and there's accountability and, and we grow. We grow when we conversate. No matter what we do, we grow when we conversate. My wife was telling me that my brother-in-law that lives in uh, California, well, the Northern California, is a gamer. And he has all the late, he got all the stuff. You know where that comes from? That comes from communicating and, and figuring out this piece. And he already has an analytical mind, so he has this piece and he has that piece, and he has a whole, probably a whole war room. I still got Atari. And I still can't get past level five. All I'm saying is that's what happens in church relationships. We begin to share information. Just like we do a Tuesday town hall for our Bible study. Every Tuesday at 7 o'clock is our Bible study. We come together. And the reason why I believe that that's the best way to grow is because I grew up uh, at Bible study and it seemed like the preacher did all the talking. And I always wanted to ask some questions and they never could get in because he was on a roll with something. And, and so, you know, when the Lord called me to pastor the church, I said, I'm going to make sure everybody get a chance to say something. Plus, I ain't that smart. So sometimes people smarter than me got answers. So ain't no sense in me trying to act like I'm the smartest. Look, I only know this because I studied this. I didn't know this last week. <laughs> I studied it all week. Even when I was substituting, I was working on the sermon. Uh, uh, it was, yeah, Friday. I substituted at the school Friday because I knew I was going to go to my mother-in-law's 80th birthday party, which was all about her, which is the way I like it. She was in her world. Everybody that came made her, listen, she even came down from the second floor. <laughs> she, she had, what's that thing called? A tiara? Crown or whatever. She had a crown on. She was severe beaters in love. Her, she, she don't like no confidence. If you want to get confidence, spend some time with my mother-in-law. She'll teach you some confidence in yourself. <laughs> I let her do her thing, man. I admire her to be 80. Shoot, man, she good. And she love her house. I even told her, I said, Mother-in-law, uh, we're going to come move in here with you while we build the house. And she said, <laughs> I said see how you roll? Okay. All right. Don't get old. Charlie, she be like 89. Time out. We need to, I need to move in. I'm going to go. <laughs> 
when it comes to giving here at Asaw Community Church, and I saw somebody, I think Roger sent this to me, somebody, I don't know, somebody sent this thing to me. Uh, a preacher said, teach people to give and give from their heart. That's all you have to do. That's all you have. Let me say that again. If you want to give, you give from your heart. I do not compel people. I do not pressure people. I don't come up with no hard luck story. I don't say that the lights are about to be turned off. I don't do none of that. You know why? Because if you teach people to give, people understand the benefit of giving. And when people understand the benefit of giving, they'll give. And if they don't, it's okay. So if you a $2 giver, enjoy your $2. Nobody's ever giving it back to you. You ever been to church, put a dollar in, and they say, uh, you know what, you, you go and keep that. No, they take that dollar too. So. But here, we give online. I mean, if you're here, you want to give in the envelopes and place it in the container, you can do that. But here's the way I suggest, and the reason why I suggest this is because it just keeps everything so simple for me. Everything goes straight into the account. And at the end of the year, like I did the other day, it takes me five minutes to give the giving statements out. Everybody that gave last year should have received an email with the total giving for the year, which is tax deductible. So you can't lose. And it's a blessing to give. So go to asawcc.org and give there. Uh, I thought Minister Cecil would be here tonight, but he's not here. We want to say happy birthday to him. He's another year around the sun. Is the, I guess that's the new thing, another year around the sun. I just say another year on the same track. <laughs> just keep it moving. <laughs> but I'm so thankful for him, so he's another year. Again, continue to pray for Karen and Terrell and Linda. And again, I'm so thankful for my family that has come out tonight. Um, we're going to go over to my sister-in-law's house and watch the Green Bay and I don't know that other team that's playing. I don't even know. We're not excited. We didn't go. I'm just really going to stop by for the fellowship because her team is out, my team is out, and it really don't make no difference to us. You know? But her husband's team is the red team. They still in there. And he, he was there last night trying to tell us, I hope they lose so he can be on the bench like us. He talking about, I'm telling you what your problem is. This is what your problem is. Uh, all right, whatever. Y'all still in it. So, but anyway, um, Father God, we're so thankful for those who've come out. Thankful for the for the minds to hear the word and just not be hearers but doers of the word. Bless us now, Father, as we depart from this place, but never from your presence. In Jesus' name, Amen. One hour. <laughs>